Well, good morning. We get to do neuroradiology for an hour, and um, Judith, I did bring a, a quiz. It's good. actually a quiz from a couple years ago, but I don't think that they would have necessarily remembered the answers or would benefit from having seen it before. And repetition is good, so. Repetition is excellent. So, all right, well, uh, I was asked to kind of give a, an overview and focus on, um, you know, a broad range of, of things that have to do with neuro-ophthalmology imaging. And so I'm kind of including a smattering of orbit, ocular motor, visual, and even a little bit of, of autonomic, so kind of a, uh, a little bit of uh, everything for you. Um, our objectives, we're going we're to look at imaging strategies. We'll review the anatomy, uh, particularly of the, of the upper cranial nerves. We'll uh, come up with a, develop, a differential strategy for how we uh, image both central and peripheral um, dysfunction that you will see in clinic. And then we'll uh, look at uh, appearance of common and common lesions as they uh, uh, are seen on CT and MRI. The imaging strategy that we will use for, for really the vast majority of, of neuro-ophthalmology uh, conditions is what we would call the orbit protocol. Now, in the radiology world, um, we don't have as much distinction about the way that you use words like ophthalmologic and orbital, but um, to the radiologist, orbit basically means uh, a horizontal slab through the middle of the face that gets the eyes, the orbits, the central skull base, and the cisternal and central pathways of the cranial nerves. And that region really covers the vast majority of everything that you, that you need to see. Um, we call this, uh, in head and neck imaging, uh, the six pack. These six sequences, so we do a T2 and a fat set, a stir, which is basically the same thing as a T2 with a fat set, just acquired in a little different way, a T1 pre-contrast and then T1 post-contrast with fat set. These three sequences done axial and coronal. Uh, thin section through the orbit and midbrain region. This covers really the vast majority of everything that you will need to see. Uh, in addition, we throw in uh, one of these uh, heavily T2 weighted sequences. What these do is these give you so much fluid signal that it makes sort of a black and white image where everything is either fluid or it's not fluid. And it, it gives you a nice way to see what's in the cisterns in, in particular. So we use this for looking for the the cranial nerve pathways. There, there are two sequences that you might uh, see referred to. These are vendor specific terms. You don't really need to know what they are, um, but you'll often hear us talk about, about a KISS or a T2 space sequence. This is probably the one, the space that we use the most around here um, with our Siemens equipment. And the other major name for it is Fiesta. Fiesta, uh, if you are in a GE system. Like the VA? Uh, the VA does have one GE scanner still, so you may see that, that term pop up, yeah. Um, and then, of course, uh, we always throw in some whole brain sequences because uh, a number of conditions will have other intracranial manifestations. It just, it's a good idea to see what else is going on. Um, we're surprised often enough by what we see that we weren't expecting that we just make sure that we don't, don't miss anything uh, in the rest of the brain. So here's your, uh, your six pack of imaging. These two are the uh, T2 weighted, and they're T2 weighted. If you look at your internal control, your, your vitreous and your, and your CSF, uh, these are T2 weighted, but the fat is dark. And you can get the fat dark a couple of ways. You can do a spin, e a spin echo sequence and then apply a fat suppression pulse that makes this, the fat signal go away. Or you can do a stir, uh, which basically never had fat signal ex uh, excited to begin with, and so there's nothing to suppress. It just, it's a little cleaner. Um, in different circumstances, you have different kinds of artifacts, so usually we'll, we'll do one of these two with a T2 uh, fat set, the other one with a stir, just so we get one of each in case there are some technical problems, a little bit uh, uh, just hedging your bets that you get one good sequence to see everything. Uh, a T1 uh, without contrast. Um, sometimes you'll see some practices will do a T1 pre-contrast uh, with fat suppression, but generally you like to see the fat in the orbits, the deep face, and the skull base because it gives you nice intrinsic contrast. And sometimes if you have problems with your post-contrast sequences, you can see a lot just by knowing uh, where the fat has been replaced. And then the post-contrast sequences, or we see vascular and physiologic enhancement, many of, of the pathologic processes. And in this case, we do like to suppress the fat because both fat and gadolinium 
are going to be bright, and they, uh, we want one of those to go away, so we suppress the fat signal. And this is what one of those heavily T2-weighted uh, uh, Chiesa Fiesta or T2 star sequences. And these aren't really good for looking at, at the soft tissues and the neurological structures because everything gets kind of very dark and black. But what you do see is a very stark contrast between tissue and CSF. So the nerves uh, show up really, really nicely. And this is a sequence specifically to look for the cisternal segments of the cranial nerves. Uh, vascular imaging is a big part also of, of, of what we do. Uh, CT is, is pretty bulletproof in terms of, of getting it done. Uh, patients who have a lot of issues, maybe can't lie in a scanner, maybe have contraindications, uh, CT is a very reliable way uh, to get uh, angiographic imaging. Uh, radiation obviously is, is a potential risk. Um, and then MRA is a, a little more complicated. Because the patient is often already in the MR scanner, um, doing angiographic imaging while they're there is often a, a good idea. And you get a, a little bit different kind of information. The pendulum has swung a little bit. Um, for a, a <clears throat> Before we had really a good, fast uh, uh, resolution with CT, uh, MRA was maybe a little bit preferred. And then as CT got very, very fast, very high resolution, we started to, pr to prefer CT a little bit for its uh, spatial resolution. And uh, I think in the, in the last couple of years, it's been maybe a bit more of a swing. Some of the more advanced MR techniques, especially looking for things like plaque characterization, now there's uh, a reason to, to maybe favor MRI, MRA a little bit. Um, when we do an, an MR sequence, it's a little bit more complicated. There's the time of flight technique, which is a non-contrast technique. That's basically looking for things that move. Um, you can also do a contrast technique, which, which you inject gadolinium and dynamically watch it as it does a first pass through um, the uh, cervical cerebral vessels. And then we also have some of these uh, techniques like thrombosensitive techniques looking for plaque hemorrhage. Um, these are useful for particularly patients with atherosclerotic disease and we're looking for um, carotid occlusive or dissection and things like that. The MR uh, images can, can, be, can be very uh, pretty. The uh, time of flight sequences and the uh, dynamic sequences, uh, because you get so much uh, resolution, so much uh, signal from the intravascular uh, contrast or signal that you, you can get a subtraction that shows you a really nice view of what the vessels look like. And this is one of those um, thrombosensitive techniques. Uh, a way to identify subintival thrombus or dissection in the setting of a, of a patient with uh, with an underlying uh, disease process. Uh, these sequences are particularly good at bringing this out and making it very obvious uh, that you have a dissection uh, or possibly an occlusion. All right, let's talk about anatomy before we move on, on to pathology. We uh, approach the uh, anatomy of the skull base by looking at it in these four segments. So this is a way to kind of get your arms around the, the great complexity of the skull base. And when we're talking about <coughs> neuroophthalmology imaging, we're really looking at um, the central skull base. This is, this is where the, the cranial nerves pass that are of interest uh, to these disease processes and where we'll focus our attention. But you can kind of think of, of these as ways to segment out, kind of going from, just if you go down the, the list of cranial nerves, uh, the way to segment out um, these regions and, and uh, talk about them individually. But we'll spend our time with the central skull base. Uh, it is made up primarily of the sphenoid bone, especially the greater wing. You also have uh, portions of the basal sphenoid and the cella and the, the, all the complex foramina that we're going to um, deal with here and then the upper to midcranial nerves that pass through them. Uh, so we can make a, a long list of, of foramina and structures that pass through them. Of these, uh, the two that are the most meaningful to us are going to be the optic canal with the second cranial nerve and then the superior orbital fissure with the uh, ocular motor as well as uh, some trigeminal. These other um, pathways uh, will, will come up rotundum with, with V2. These become more issues with the evaluation of the deep face, often more of, of a of a ENT kind of evaluation. And then spinosum and vidium, these uh, do have some pathologic processes that we may, we, we may visit, but as much as anything, we need to know what they are so we don't confuse them with maybe the areas that we spend more time. 
So here's a series of images axial from superior to inferior. And then we have some, some uh, coronal sequences. If we look at the axials here, starting up at the top, if you have a slice that's going through the optic canals, notice how they're angling toward each other. So that is the X of the chiasm. And it's an easy mistake to confuse the optic canal with the foramina right below it, which is the superior orbital fissures. The way you tell the difference is, again, these are coming in at an X, and just below that, the superior fissures are kind of coming straight back. And um, be surprised how hard it is sometimes to tell these apart, but once you get that sort of morphology in your mind, it'll, it'll be pretty clear. If you go a little bit further down, you get this little short canal there, which is foramen rotundum, and right in front of that is this little space of pterygopallidine fossa. And if you keep going down further, you get this kind of elongated, sickle-shaped canal, which is the Vidian canal. Uh, in the coronal plane, at the level of the superior fissure, you'll notice that the, the superior and inferior fissure are continuous. There's sort of like this gash right through the back of the, of the orbital apex. And then as you go a, a little further back, uh, you can see that the superior fissure kind of goes back toward where we're going to have um, Maybe one other piece of anatomy we'll talk about first is the uh, clinoid processes are a landmark that you can, that you can identify. Now, an MR, it's hard to see them on CT, so we kind of train our brains to look at, um, at the anatomy in, in CT, and then you project that when you get to the MR. So the clinoid processes are attached to the basal sphenoid where the, the sinus is by this little bit of bone, the optic strut. And the optic strut um, is, a, is a distinction that provides a kind of a uh, a physical barrier between the optic canal and superior fissure. So optic canal, superior fissure. And remember the optic canals, they're at an angle. So when you do a coronal slice, you're not going to see the optic canal as a circle. You're going to see it as kind of an oval or maybe just a partially enclosed oval. So you have to kind of know where it is because it's not going to show up as a, as a discrete circle. So here's the uh, superior fissure. And then below that, remember the inferior fissure, if you take it straight back, it's going to become foramen rotundum because that's where V2 runs through. So rotundum and rotundum, superior optic canal. As you go back a bit further, um, you can see rotundum more discreetly here and here, and then it goes back toward the um, trigeminal uh, cave or Meckles cave. Uh, this little dent here is called the, the porous trigeminus. And then we also see another foramen that pops up here, which is right there, this little small one down below. That's the Vidian canal. Sometimes the Vidian canal is more conspicuous than rotundum, so it's easy. Sometimes people will confuse, it, confuse those two. So the way to remember is rotundum is, is more superior, a little more lateral uh, than the Vidian canal. So these are the landmarks that we uh, learn on CT, and then we remember them, we project them onto, onto MR when we get to those images. Um, a drawing of the, of the central skull base. Um, Clinoid process, uh, the uh, optic strut would be right underneath that. Second, uh, the, the optic nerve, and then the superior fissure with uh, three, four, six, and V1 going through it. Inferior fissure, or the rotundum here going toward inferior fissure. And then if we were to go uh, further down, we would see ovale with V3 going through it kind of straight down. And then same view from below. Okay, so anatomic considerations. Um, with the optic nerve, we begin by looking at the globe and the orbit and the intraorbital nerve. This becomes more of, a, of an orbit discussion. Um, as you go back, uh, we get to the optic canal and then the inter intracanalicular portion of the nerve. This can be actually relatively hard to see, so again, you have to know, know where it lives to look for subtle abnormalities there. Uh, further approximately into the cisternal segment of the nerve, the chiasm, and the tract, uh, and then going further back into the lateral geniculate. And then once we get into the radiations, the cortex becomes more of a, of a brain imaging uh, uh, situation. Uh, intraorbital, um, we won't spend a lot of time about um, today, um, other than to be aware of the fact that we have a, this, the, the second cranial nerve, is, uh, of course, is a, a central nervous system tract, so it has a dural sheath surrounding it, and both of those uh, structures can have abnormalities that we'll see within the orbit. Um, <clears throat> a close-up here of the optic canal 
Again, we see it as an oval here, the optic strut and the, and the coronary process separating the, the canal from the superior fissure. And if you take that image and go to a corresponding MRI, this is what it will look like. Not as conspicuous, but now we know where everything is. We know that we have the sphenoid sinus, the basi sphenoid, clinoid processes, optic strut, and so there's your optic nerve right there and there. And if you find that, then you can track it as you go forward and backward through those coronal sequences. <coughs> so here we have the optic nerve here and here, clinoid processes, sphenoid sinus, optic nerve, Going back now in the cisternal portion, back toward the chiasm, and then chiasm relationship to the, the cella, the, the uh, pituitary stalk and the pituitary gland, further back toward the geniculate, and then we're into the brain. So that is uh, how we identify it, and, and again, this is a, a, uh, one of those uh, KISS or um, T2 space sequences that lets us see the, the structure very, uh, very clearly. But again, Use your CT knowledge um, to project onto the MR so you can find these structures. The optic chiasm can be seen as a structure if you get the angle just right. Now, uh, the angle of the chiasm is not true axial. It's about 15 to 20 degrees off. So usually we won't get a picture that looks like this unless you go out of your way to ask for it. So uh, usually we don't need this image uh, per se, but if there's a particular reason to want to identify uh, these structures in plane, you can get a sequence that will, uh, that will lay that out for you. But this is, this is what they would look like if you were in an off-axial plane like that. Midline sagittal anatomy is, is also something that um, you want to be familiar with. Um, so in this drawing, third ventricle, and along the floor of the third ventricle, there are some structures that are going to be really conspicuous. So floor of the third ventricle, uh, just off the side, you're going to have hypothalamus, mammary bodies. And you're going to have these two little recesses right here at the front of the third ventricle. One of them is going to go down into the infundibulum, so make it sort of like a little central channel within the infundibulum partway down toward the pituitary. And then right in front of that, you're going to have a little pocket that is right above the optic chiasm. And that is the, uh, the uh, chiasmatic recess. And, and if you look at this shape, to me it looks kind of like the head of a bird. So there's, there's the bird beak and the eye of the bird. The beak is the, the chiasmatic and the infundibular recesses. So if you look at an MRI, you can see those things really pretty clearly, right? So now you see the bird. So third ventricle, mass intermedia, floor of the third ventricle, mammary body. There is the infundibular recess going down toward the pituitary, optic chiasm, chiasmatic recess. So there is the optic chiasm. So on a midline, you can always find the optic nerve, and then you can go track it to side to side and see it as it goes into the optic canal. Uh, and this is the um, anterior commissure. Um, so the, uh, the, the physiology and, and, and pathways and right and left is the things that are all second nature to you, so I won't try to teach you anything about this. Uh, anatomic considerations of the third, fourth, and sixth uh, motor nerves. Uh, these begin as central nuclei, and we obviously try to understand their neural pathways as they come out into the cisterns and into the skull base and orbit. We have these cisternal segments that we can identify, um, and occasionally, although it's, it's somewhat uncommon, we can actually see disease processes directly affecting the cisternal segments of the nerves. And then we track them into the cavernous sinus and the central skull base where we probably have more disease that affect them. And then ultimately through the superior fissure and into the orbits. A drawing of the third cranial nerve. So here we see at uh, the level of the, the midbrain, the nerves come along, uh, come out along the lateral margins of the intraparenchymal cistern. They come forward down a little bit and they pass right between P1 segment of the, of the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebral artery uh, as they pass through the cisternal segment into the cavernous sinus and through the superior fissure into the orbit. From the side, here we see at the level of the midbrain, um, this uh, nerve comes out into bronchial cistern, descends a little bit, sort of hooks underneath this P1 segment above the superior cerebral artery through the cistern into the cavernous sinus, superior fissure and then into the orbit. Uh, 
on these high, uh, heavily titubated sequences, you can see them coming out. Again, because they're descending a little bit as they come out of, this, of the, uh, the intrapeduncular cistern, you won't see them as a line necessarily. They'll drop a little bit. And then as they come forward here to the cistern, as they angle toward, as they head toward the uh, cavernous sinus, you'll see them uh, coming forward. And then there are these little pockets of CSF around them. That's the uh, oculomotor cistern that you'll see uh, surrounding these nerves as they're heading into the cavernous sinus. Uh, in coronal plane, so here are the third nerves. Again, P1 segments of the PCA, SCA, and there they are right in between those two arterial branches. And then as they come forward, here we see that, that little pocket of CSF, the oculomotor cistern. And this is to, again, remind us of that relationship between the vascular structures um, of the P1s and the SCAs and the third nerves. We have these little bits of the carotids drawn to remind us that there are the posterior communicating arteries, and this relationship is what sets up these nerves for a possible problem if you have an aneurysm right there. Fourth nerve, uh, just a little bit below the third nerves in the midbrain, these exit around the back, cross along the dorsal <coughs> midbrain, through the interpreduncular cistern, I'm sorry, through the uh, uh, perimesencephalic cistern, and then has a similar course in that it passes between these two arterial branches as it goes into the uh, cavernous sinus, other side the same thing. So similar to the third nerve after it comes around the back. From the side, uh, we see it exiting uh, on the back. It decussates around the back into the paramesencephalic cistern between the two arterial branches and then into the cavernous sinus and orbit. This is a, a much smaller nerve, so it's harder to see, but you can often find a linear structure that is a candidate for this nerve, and since it has a somewhat unique course, you can usually identify it as um, uh, a discrete structure, although it's not as reliable as the third nerve. In the coronal plane, you may be able to identify it as a, a small structure uh, coursing around the side. Because there are venous structures that, that pass in the same location, I think it's a little hard to be too um, dogmatic about saying I know what that is, but sometimes we'll see a lesion that is clearly from the fourth nerve, and we'll show you an example of that. Uh, but as a normal structure, it might be um, inconsistently found. The fifth nerve doesn't have a lot to do with um, ocular motor uh, dysfunction, but it is such a prominent structure, and it does have branches that come into the orbit. We want to make sure that we know how it looks as well. Um, large ganglion sitting in Meckles Cave. It's got the preganglionic pre segment that comes around the pons, sort of at the mid-pons level, and it has uh, components that will go through the superior fissure, um, foramen rotundum inferior fissure, and then as well as down in the foramen ovale. The fifth nerve is very easy to see. Even on uh, routine brain imaging, you'll, you'll usually see it as this big trunk of uh, fibers coming out the lateral pons at the level of the mid-pons headed towards uh, Meckel's cave. The sixth nerve has its nuclei uh, at the level of the mid to upper pons, uh, just uh, anterior to the fourth ventricle. And it has the, its fibers that, that come out just below the pons and then ascend up and into the prepontine cistern through the little uh, reflection of dura in Durello's canal as it's headed toward the cavernous sinus. And it has this relationship that we, we understand about the, uh, the facial loop as it goes around it at the back of the pons. From the side here we see uh, the, the sixth nucleus, the fibers ex exiting under the belly of the pons, ascending in the prepontine cistern as they go up to go through this dural, uh, this dural reflection into the cavernous sinus. Uh, this is also a small structure, but because it runs in a in, in a course that doesn't really have anything else there um, to confuse it with, it's usually pretty uh, reliable to find this as a structure that is running almost straight anterior like this, a little bit sort of like a shallow V-shape coming forward. It's ascending, so you won't necessarily see it as a line in the axial, um, but in, in the sagittal, if you do a, an acquisition, you can actually see the, the sixth nerve uh, in that very characteristic course, and nothing else really runs there, so that's usually um, relatively straightforward to try and identify, even though it's quite small. And then we're aware of all of these nerves that have uh, a course through the cavernous sinus, uh, the third and the fourth nerves, uh, 
Um, and then the sixth nerve is <coughs> described as being the one that is the most suspended internally within the cavernous sinus. And given that it, it has uh, this a lot of exposure around it and it's a relatively small nerve, is sometimes said to be the nerve that is the most likely to have um, uh, an early manifestation of a cranial neuropathy if you do have a cavernous sinus process, although ultimately you would expect all of the cavernous sinus nerves to potentially be affected uh, if you had a disease process, and then uh, the branches of, of five as well. Okay, so let's talk um, pathology. All right, visual pathology. Um, Tumors of the uh, orbit, skull and cisterns, uh, optic in the orbit, or cisterns optic glioma, meningioma, two of the, of the more common lesions we might see causing uh, visual pathway dysfunction. There's any number of orbital masses that we don't have a lot of time to talk about. We'll, we'll just maybe put a list up and, and mention them briefly. Um, pituitary disease, because of its relationship with the chiasm, uh, uh, is not an uncommon cause of visual disturbance and uh, metastases of the skull base in particular, but also cisternal disease. Um, optic pathway glioma can occur anywhere in the orbit. It has an association with NF1 that's, that's minor. Uh, they have some variable appearance, usually brought on T2. Enhancement can be uh, quite variable, um, and in that it behaves a little bit like um, pilocytic sort of an astrocytoma, you can have a lot of enhancement without it being uh, an advanced grade tumor, uh, uh, usually a lower grade tumor, especially in, in younger patients. It can uh, affect any part of the pathway. Here we see bilateral optic pathway gliomas, relatively uh, no enhancement, uh, getting all the way back to the chiasm. So um, this is a, a condition that you may see in your, in your pediatric patients. Uh, meningioma is a disease of older patients, um, and it has a characteristic appearance of this tram track calcification that is a hallmark. Uh, not uncommonly, we will get patients who we have a, maybe an optic ne uh, neuropathy. We think we see something on MRI. We're not sure. We'd like to get one more piece of data. We might, after the MR, get a CT to find those calcifications, because if you see those calcifications, that's, pr that's uh, pretty past mnemonic for an optic, path, an optic uh, nerve meningioma in the orbit. But we see that the tram track enhancement of the, uh, of the dural mass that's surrounding the nerve, and then the, the corresponding calcification. Um, on T2, a sign that's been associated with um, uh, optic nerve meningioma is a little perioptic cyst that collects the back uh, just behind the globe, presumably due to the, the mass effect from uh, the, the dural mass. Uh, macroadenoma uh, has the, the possibility of causing compression of the chiasm because it lives right below that cisternal portion of, of the optic pathways. Um, on imaging, what we see is a cellular mass that doesn't have a discrete gland apart from it, so it appears to be coming from the gland. Um, the hourglass contour has to do with the fact that there's a, diaph a little diaphragm of cellae that the pituitary sort of squeezes through as it's going upward. A generally intense enhancement, but we want to be aware of the fact that these things may contain uh, blood or cysts, and you may have areas of non-enhancement within them. Um, one uh, manifestation that we need to be aware of and that you uh, will hopefully get informed of from us if we see it is, is um, hemorrhage within the gland will show up as an area of non-enhancement. Now, hemorrhage can be, can be quite bright on T1 when it's acute or subacute, so we have to be aware of looking at our pre and our post contrast sequences to make sure that we know that you have an area of, of, of blood within it. And one reason why this matters is because there aren't that many things that are neuroradiological emergencies. We don't live the very fast-paced lives that you guys live where you're taking care of patients, you have to deal with something right away. But there are some things that when we see, they get our attention, we say, we have to deal with this right now, tonight. This can't wait till tomorrow. And apoplexy is one, because if these patients show up with a large tumor that has hemorrhage and has sudden mass effect on the chiasm, that needs to be decompressed immediately. And so we need to be aware of these imaging manifestations of, of apoplexy that can be an emergency that has to be dealt with right away. Uh, there's a long list of orbital masses that we won't have time uh, to go through. The list is a little different from a, adults uh, versus kids. I mean, adults, things like uh, cavernous hemangioma, lymphoproliferative disease, uh, tumors of the adnexa, metastases. In the pediatric 
uh, population, we have different kind of vascular lesions, usually um, malformations, uh, sarcomas, Langerhans cell disease, metastatic uh, tumors, and so forth. And these generally become uh, <coughs> orbital discussions, but they can affect um, vision. Maybe just one mention of a kind of a metastatic process that is uncommon but can show up uh, as, as visual dysfunction. This is a patient with uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. This is a post-contrast T1. Notice how you have a ring of enhancement uh, all the way down um, the intraorbital course of the nerve. This is not a meningioma. This is leptomeningeal breast uh, metast metastatic disease that is following the CSF down the sheaths into the orbits. And this is an uncommon but uh, a known manifestation of metastatic disease uh, that is something you might see in the orbits. Uh, inflammatory optic nerve disease, um, acute optic neuritis, especially associated with demyelinating disease and, and idiopathic uh, inflammation. There are other kinds of, of optic nerve disease that are specific um, and granulomatous disease uh, that we uh, commonly see, but there, there's a lot of imaging overlap between these, so we include them in our differential lists. Here's a, an appearance of a patient with acute optic neuritis. You see a T2 sequence. Again, notice the CSF for your internal controls, normal CSF, normal optic nerve. On the right, you have a swollen optic nerve. It's kind of facing all the CSF, and the nerve itself is, is very bright. On the post-contrast T1, you can see that the nerve is, is enhancing uh, compared to the normal nerve, which should have should be nearly black and have almost no enhancement, maybe a little bit of normal perioptic enhancement, uh, but this is an abnormally enhancing nerve in a patient with acute optic neuritis. And in these patients, getting the brain imaging is just as important as getting, perhaps more important than getting the intraorbital imaging uh, to identify uh, the very um, common uh, correlating finding of, of you know a presentation of demyelinating disease. Uh, idiopathic inflammation uh, that affects the optic nerve. There are any number of manifestations, and we, we can kind of classify how a uh, pseudotumor shows up depending on what part of, of the, the orbit and skull base it involves. Uh, the anterior form is the one that may affect uh, the optic nerve in a somewhat isolated fashion. Generally, when you have uh, a lot of disease, it's, it's not as, as um, specific to just uh, the visual pathways, but occasionally it might be. Um, here's an example of a of a lesion that was a patient of Dr. DeGrees many years ago uh, that we initially diagnosed. The inflammatory component wasn't as clear on the clinical presentation. We even wondered to ourselves, this kind of looks a little bit like a meningioma, but after uh, some time and some steroids, it went away. And this was a, an example of an unusual pseudotumor. Uh, this is a patient with uh, sarcoidosis, and just to remind us the many manifestations you can get with granulomatous disease. Notice we have this this striking diffuse enhancement and enlargement of the optic nerve, but you also have disease involving the muscles. You also have, a, uh, intra, uh, this is a third nerve, and also even some supercellular disease. So you can have a lot of different manifestations of, of some of these inflammatory conditions. Ischemia uh, of the optic nerve, um, two types that we might see, um, the anterior and the posterior form. Um, you can also see ischemic disease showing up as visual dysfunction when you have uh, somewhat localized uh, cortical involvement from uh, thromboembolic disease. Um, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which we associate with uh, older patients and uh, uh, microvascular kind of disease. Imaging on that is, is often somewhat normal. You may see a little bit of enhancement of the optic nerve head. Uh, this is a, a very distinct entity and much, much more common than the dreaded posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which this is from a patient from just a couple of weeks ago that, that some of you probably saw, a very unfortunate uh, young man who had a very extensive skull base and uh, upper cervical surgery, which is associated with this condition. And here we see on the diffusion sequence, these long segments. His case was, was, was bilateral and a devastating complication, um, uh, a dreaded but unfortunately not always possible to avoid problem with certain um, perisurgical, perianesthetic uh, uh, um, uh, operative conditions. And then thromboembolic disease showing up as visual dysfunction. If you, if you have a, a stroke that picks off the visual cortex, especially if you've, you've got something that's localized to uh, the, the posterior cerebral arteries uh, territory, you may show up with a primarily uh, visual dysfunction. We do perfusion and diffusion imaging uh, to identify this. This is, uh, again, the posterior cerebral artery territory. Uh, 
Now this can come either through the anterior circulation, if you have a big PCOM, or maybe even a fetal origin PCA, uh, a, a carotid embolus can do this, uh, or also, of course, if you have a vertebral basal uh, event, you can get a PCA stroke. One of the things to be aware of, when you're doing um, uh, posterior cerebral artery imaging, you have to know uh, the anatomy in the paramesencephalic cistern. You actually have two vessels that live in the paramesencephalic cistern that go around um, the midbrain. One of them is a vein, the other one is an artery. You need to know that the vein is on top and the artery is below, so that the stroke here is the missing artery right below the vein. These are the, the, the basal veins of Rosenthal. Okay, moving on to pathology of the um, ocular motor structures. Uh, again, as with, with uh, visual pathways, inflammatory uh, disease, especially uh, idiopathic inflammation, sarcoid can give you uh, manifestations that will, that will uh, cause ocular motor dysfunction. Then, of course, uh, thyroid overtopathy may be one of the more common conditions that you will see uh, giving you dysfunction. And some tumors, uh, lymphoproliferative disease and, and MATS, which we won't talk a whole lot about. Same list of um, the subtypes of pseudotumor. And the areas that may affect um, the cranial nerves, or the uh, ocular motor functions, uh, are going to be in particular the myositic form. And you can have pseudotumor that just affects the muscles. There's also this, this apical form, the Toulouse-Hunt uh, disease, that will give you multiple painful cranial neuropathies. Here's an example of a patient who presented with a right-sided trochlear palsy. And the only imaging finding was a subtle enlargement of, this, of the superior oblique compared to the other side. This is a presumptive diagnosis because after the patient got steroids, it went away. And here's an example of a patient with a Toulouse Hunt. This is a Dr. Degrees patient from a couple of weeks ago who um, uh, reminded me that I really need to read the history. This was, we read this at night. At first we looked at this and the history was, um, I think, painful ophthalmoplegia or something uh, like that. And we get so many scans that come through from clinicians who don't necessarily know as much as Dr. Degree that we sometimes just read the scans and don't necessarily uh, get the finer points. And the next morning, uh, she comes down and says, this patient really worries me. Can we look at these pictures again and make sure there's not something? And sure enough, on closer inspection, we see that there is this mass-like enhancement in the anterior cavernous sinus heading right into the superior ophthalmic, uh, superior or uh, orbital fissure, a classic presentation of uh, pseudotumor, um, what we would call Toulouse. So, I presume that's what this patient ended up having. I think so. Yeah. So anyway, a, a lesson for us that uh, when it comes from our ophthalmologic colleagues, we really need to pay attention uh, to the things that you tell us. Or just the abnormality. Uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy, Graves' disease. Uh, this shows up as generally symmetric, <coughs> non-uniform enlargement of the uh, extra the uh, extraocular muscles. We, we use the, the mnemonic inferior, medial, superior lateral oblique is a way to think of their uh, commonness of involvement. Although, and I think inferior medial, inferior medial and superior in particular, but we do have some patients who have preferentially superior muscle involvement. So this isn't uh, completely um, uh, uh, followed. Obliques uh, and lateral is very uncommon though. So especially the inferior medial and superior are the most commonly involved muscles. Uh, uh, these can, uh, is something that can be seen on CT and MRI. Generally, you, uh, the clinical presentation is, seems to be clear enough that we don't often get imaging confirmation, but in confusing cases, uh, we might be able to help you out and identify the characteristic appearance of uh, muscle involvement. Uh, it can be asymmetric as on this MR. The, the left uh, muscles seem to be more involved than the right, but pathologically, histopathologically, um, they're all going to be positive, but they may be um, macroscopically uh, asymmetric in their involvement. Lymphoproliferative disease is a somewhat uh, common malignancy that can affect the orbit, and we won't spend a lot of time with this, but just be aware that lymphoma is a very solid mass. It, it doesn't have necrosis, it doesn't have cysts. It shows up as this, these sheets of infiltrating tissue. It can occur anywhere in the orbit or skull base. Uh, it's pliable. We sometimes use the word plastic because it tends to, tends to get into things. It can cause some bone destruction, but it can sort of just wrap around and uh, uh, it looks a lot like an inflammatory process. In fact, um, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, common likenesses that we talk about in neuroradiology is that 
lymphoma and granulomatous disease have a lot of imaging overlap. They look, look a lot like each other. So if you see yourself thinking about one, you often include the other uh, in the differential. Uh, here's an example of a patient with uh, orbital lymphoma involving a lacrimal gland, uh, the, the rectus muscle, a little bit of intracranial disease, and also uh, intracranial disease as well. This looks an awful lot like that case of sarcoid I showed you several slides ago. Um, heading further back now for the uh, ocular motor um, dysfunction, uh, tumors that affect the skull base and cisterns. Uh, pituitary, not so much because the pituitary tends to be more midline well behaved. When it extends, it goes up usually, uh, but it can go off to the side and get into the cavernous sinus. Uh, meningioma, the, the petroclival region uh, is a very common location to get meningiomas. So uh, to have a meningioma affect the cranial nerves, uh, is not at all uh, uncommon. Uh, and then metastatic disease involving the skull base, the bones of the skull base, or leptomeningeal uh, uh, structures involving the, the nerves in the cisterns. Schwannoma uh, is a lesion we occasionally see, relatively rare in the cranial nerves, but we'll show a couple of examples of that. Here's an example of a pituitary adenoma that did actually go off to the side. It's unusual, again, they usually go up, but they can invade the cavernous sinuses, and when they do, you can get uh, uh, ocular motor uh, uh, symptoms as well as visual symptoms. Here's a typical appearance of a, a kind of a cavernous sinus petroclival region meningioma. We see a mass along the lateral margin of the, of the cella, filling up uh, the cavernous sinus headed toward the superior fissure. And again, lateral margin of the cavernous sinus become a little bit forward. This is gonna go straight toward the superior fissure. Um, and this, this looks a little bit like that case of pseudotumor, that Tulsa hunt that we saw. But in these cases, instead of being painful, it's going to be chronic, progressive uh, symptoms. And these are going to have a, generally a fairly slow growth and a fairly typical um, imaging appearance for meningioma. Notice you have the, 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 the chronic uh, denervation atrophy of that uh, medial rectus muscle. Uh, this is just an example of leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. This could be um, primary glial malignancy, it could be lymphoma, uh, could be fungal disease, could be sarcoid, could be any number of leptomeningeal processes. But when you have this much disease, you're going to be able, you're going to expect to see a lot of multiple cranial nerves involved. TB, exactly. Schwannomas of the uh, the mid cranial nerves are relatively uncommon, but we do see them. Here's an example of one that's coming off the, the bottom of the third nerve. Uh, when they are isolated, they're somewhat rare. They can be associated with uh, NF2. Uh, when they do show up on imaging, they will, they will be seen as a nodular mass in the cistern, right where we know the node, the, uh, the nerve lips. So here's an example of a patient who has asymmetric superior obliques. In this case, it's atrophied on the left, and if you look at this patient's paramesencephalic cistern, sure enough, there is a nodule right where we know that fourth nerve runs in that paramesencephalic cistern. This is a presumptive schwannoma. No one's going to go after this because you can only make things worse, but that would be almost certainly what this is. And we've seen a number of these over the years, and um, intraorbital schwannomas aren't that common. When we do see them, they tend to be in the cisterns, and for the fourth, it really likes this uh, location around the side of the midbrain. Hey Chris, on this picture, can you sort of show where the tinctorium is and emphasize for our ophthalmology residents how vulnerable the fourth nerve is as it uh, sort of parallels the tinctorium? So the way they identify the tinctorium and axial is you kind of have to notice the difference between cerebellum and, and uh, occipital lobes and temporal lobes. So cerebellum is going to have the folia mm -hmm. in it. And because the, the tentorum is sort of angled like, a, like a, a shallow tent, in an axial slice, you're going to get both supratentorial and infratentorial in the same picture. So this slice shows cerebellum, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. What that means is the tentorum is between those. So whatever is between this and this, there's your tentorum there and there. It's, you often get a little bit of venous structures that go along the tentorum. So that's how you can identify it there. And there you can see the tentorium right there, there's your, your uh, cerebral hemispheres and then the cerebellum below it. So there is the tentorium. That little bit of vascularity will, on a post contrast will help you identify it. And as Julia points out, the proximity of that tentorium to the nerve uh, 
is one that's just waiting for a reason to get injured. So. There's head trauma mm -hmm. and neurosurgical procedures. Yeah. And the fact that it is a small nerve that's it's very long course means it's a very exposed nerve and has a uh, kind of a, a fragility to it that makes it um, not uncommonly affected. This is an example of a sixth cranial neuro, uh, schwannoma. Uh, this has, uh, when these schwannomas get big, they can get a little bit of uh, cystic degeneration in them. Not necrosis exactly, but they can be heterogeneous in their enhancement. This one we know it's right in that area of Dorellis Canal, and this patient also had a, a sixth nerve dysfunction that was chronic and didn't have any other signs of, of, uh, of malignancy. And then further back in the skull basin cisterns, uh, talking about infectious disease. Um, skull basin infection, <coughs> this is uncommon to see, but sometimes in diabetic patients who may have things like um, uh, osteomyelitis, we've seen uh, some of these uh, patients uh, over the years that come up with uh, aggressive or chronic uh, persistent skull base infections that can get into the central skull base. Um, and then some vascular conditions, thrombosis, uh, cavernous sinus, uh, carotid fistula, aneurysms that can affect uh, the structures in the central skull base. Um, Gradenigo's uh, is a, a skull base osteomyelitis that's, that's uh, particularly at the Peter's apex, but can also be uh, getting into the, the central skull base, the, the basic sphenoid. Um, this is more or less an extension of acute otitis, um, otomastoiditis. Uh, this is an airspace when it is pneumatized, and so it it shares the same disease processes as the middle ear and mastoid. In particular, the sixth cranial nerve is, is at risk here because it has that course that runs right over the Peter's apex going into the cavernous sinus through that little dural refle reflection of Dorellis Canal it makes it particularly susceptible. So six is kind of the classic uh, neuropathy that we see with, with Peter's apocytis. Um, and as with other areas of infection, we're looking for rim enhancing heterogeneous enhancement, often with, with dural disease. Uh, Peter's apex fluid, in the case of Gradenigo's um, otomastoiditis as well. Cavernous sinus thrombosis is a, is a dreaded complication. Um, it is associated um, uh, in the in, in infectious conditions with, with acute or chronic sinusitis. In this case, this patient has pretty clearly chronic disease. Look at how much mucoperiosteal thickening you have. That sinus has been inflamed and reactive for a uh, for a long time. Uh, so this patient is, is no stranger probably to sinus disease and sinus pain, but they presented somewhat acutely uh, with acute uh, multiple cranial neuropathies. And if you look kind of closely, the cavernous sinus looks way bigger than it should. We have the, the, the dural margins are pushed out, and there's a concern that this is going to be a cavernous sinus thrombosis in a previously chronic pseudoid sinusitis. Uh, this can occur with sinusitis. Uh, head and neck cellulitis, and the, the presentation of multiple cranial neuropathies again, uh, especially six, uh, because of its course through the cavernous sinus. On imaging, what we're looking for is an enlargement and often bowing of the margin of the cavernous sinus. And on contrast imaging, you see non-enhancing clot. The cavernous sinus should enhance because it's just a venous space. And when you see soft tissue that's not enhancing, that is what thrombus is, is going to look like. You can also see an enlarged superior ophthalmic vein due to pressure effects. So here's that same patient on a T2 sequence. Notice you have this markedly enlarged cavernous sinus with these sort of outwardly bowing margins. There's all this stuff in here. That's going to be either tumor or it's, or it's going to be thrombus. And on the post-contrast sequences, you have these large areas that, um, if it was just venous space, let's say you had a cavernous carotid fistula and the, and, the, and the cavernous sinus was just full of you know, pressurized blood, it ought to be very, very bright. But what you have instead is these large areas of non-enhancing thrombus, especially on, on the right side. Uh, moving on to some other uh, carotid lesions in the skull base. When you see either uh, an aneurysm or a fistula, complex flow on MR is going to be kind of your tip-off. Uh, vessels have a lot of signal irregularities uh, uh, when they're tortuous and when they're arterial in part because with, with MRI, there are, there are competing signal effects that they can get in the way. If you give gadolinium, gadolinium is bright on T1, but things that move quickly cause blackness, the flow void. So if you have both 
gadolinium signal and flow void competing with each other, and then you add to it the tortuosity and turbulence that comes with, with flow sometimes, it can be hard to see exactly where vessels are on MRIs. We look for the complex flow. With aneurysm, uh, we look for it, obviously, enlargement, and they can be partially thrombosed. Uh, with the fistula, we're looking for the secondary effects of the fistula, arterialization of the venous pressures, enlargement of the superior ophthalmic vein. Here's an example of a flow void in, a, in an aneurysm. One of the things to be careful of is right next door to uh, the, the, uh, the cavernous segments of the, of the uh, carotids are the clinoid processes, and, and the, an aerated clinoid process can be a dead ringer for an aneurysm, so you want to make sure you pay attention to where the clinoids are. And if you think it could be uh, uh, a clinoid aeration instead of an aneurysm, you can do uh, an angiographic sequence, or just a, a, a CT will often prove that it's just an aerated space. Here's an example of a very, of a giant aneurysm of the, of the uh, cavernous carotid, full of thrombus. Uh, it's obviously in a position to cause the same kind of mass effect that we would see with a meningioma, for example. And here's an example of a patient with a CC fistula. Here's a carotid, in, uh, an internal carotid injection. What we see is, in addition to filling these nice, normal cerebral artery branches, what you have is a, a blush of contrast in the wrong space. In fact, it's filling the cavernous sinus. And we know this is wrong because you've just barely injected the carotid and you're just barely starting to fill out the cerebral artery branches. The cerebral arteries are low resistance, high flow branches. So they, they should fill right up. If you start to see venous spaces before you've even filled out the branches of the, of the MCA, you know you have uh, a fistulous connection. In addition, you have this um, retrograde filling of the superior ophthalmic vein and even filling the cavernous sinus down into the, in the, the inferior petrosal sinus and a, a corresponding enlarged superior ophthalmic vein. Superior ophthalmic veins um, can have some normal variability. In some patients, they're just big, and so you have to be a little careful about overcalling it, but when you have other suspicions and you're trying to get more information to say, do I have something that's affecting the cavernous sinus, a really big superior ophthalmic vein can be uh, a useful piece of information. And then if we keep going further, um, uh, uh, approximately, we get into the parenchyma of the midbrain. Microvascular stroke uh, can affect uh, upper cranial nerves, demyelinating disease, and there uh, some other conditions. Occasionally, we, we've seen these small cavernous malformations that are localized enough that they pick off a cranial nerve and, and don't do much else. Ischemia that affects the, affects the midbrain um, has to do with these vertebral basal or perforators. And for that reason, isolated midbrain strokes really are not thromboembolic events. They're microvascular events. So we see them in patients with hypertension, diabetes, microvascular disease. Um, T2 is a little more sensitive than flare, so we pay attention to that, especially diffusion abnormality. And again, these are, are very small lesions, so the ADC may not always be positive. So here's an example of a patient with, with an acute uh, midbrain microvascular stroke right on diffusion, a little easier to see on the T2 than the flare. Uh, demyelinating disease, uh, no stranger to the, uh, the midbrain. Um, typical symptoms that you will see. Isolated nerve palsies are, are somewhat rare. Uh, they have been described as, as being maybe a little bit, bit more common uh, in, in six. Um, Obviously, the imaging uh, task with, with uh, demyelinating disease is to, is to find the, the whole pattern when looking for disease uh, where it, it occurs. And here's an example of a patient with a somewhat large demyelinating plaque uh, in the upper midbrain, and this would be in a, a good position to affect um, cranial nerve three. And then uh, we can occasionally uh, pick up very acute plaques on diffusion sequence. There's a, a patient with a small plaque in the region of the, of the MLF you would expect them to have maybe some typical symptoms. Let's see, um, it is five more minutes. I threw in uh, just a, a little bit about uh, autonomic pathology because it's part of uh, the discussion we can have with, with a neuroradiological imaging. So maybe just a few slides on this. Parasympathetic disease, um, Edinger-Westfall and its, and its pathways pretty much parallel uh, the third cranial nerve uh, um, uh, peripheral nerve fibers. And so you can kind of think of, of anatomically and, and, and in terms of disease processes, there's going to be a lot of, this, of, of overlap between that and, and ocular motor dysfunction. 
compressive lesions. Um, now, we do get into this interesting discussion about the location of the somatic versus the autonomic components of, of three as it exits uh, the midbrain and how that can affect uh, which uh, are, are affected. Um, and it gets into this discussion of pupillary involvement and whether the sphincter dysfunction uh, is, is isolated or in conjunction with, with uh, third nerve palsy. And it has to do with this phenomenon of extrinsic compression from classically an aneurysm. So um, the, the somatic fibers, or the, 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 the parasympathetic fibers on the ex, are on the exterior, and then the somatic fibers are centrally. So in theory, if you have a mass effect coming from the outside, you will get the uh, parasympathetic fibers first. And that brings us to this phenomenon of the saccular aneurysm, typically of the PCOM, that presses on the third nerve, giving you pupillar involvement, or uh, a vascular loop similar to an aneurysm. So here's a, a typical appearance of an aneurysm coming off the origin. Here's the carotid artery. There's the, the uh, posterior communicating artery going back. And the aneurysm usually occurs at the carotid artery origin of, of the PCOM. And in that location, we know where the nerve passes. It's in a location to cause extrinsic compression. Uh, here is uh, another vascular condition, not an aneurysm per se, but here we see a torturous uh, a branch of A1 that is causing the third nerve here to be displaced, and you can again see how that might cause a mechanical compression of the nerve. Sympathetic uh, dysfunction gets to be a little bit more complicated because we, ha we, we have to talk about its uh, preganglionic and postganglionic courses. Um, if it's preganglionic, uh, we have the pathway from the hypothalamus, ciliospinal, into this superior cervical ganglion. And the kind of lesions we, we see causing disease here are going to be uh, proximal neurological brachial plexus lesions, masses of the paraspinous tissues mediastinum, uh, or uh, lesions of the lung apex, classically a pancos tumor. So here's a, a patient with lymphoma affecting the uh, spinal canal, brachial plexus, and a good location to cause a pregangliana <coughs> corner. Uh, another uncommon but uh, known cause of, of pregangliana corners is trauma. This is a patient with a fracture. You can see that the, the, this is the seventh vertebral body. You can tell by the shape of the, of the, uh, the foramina. We have a fracture right there, which is right where um, those, uh, those nerves are going to run. And this patient did present with the Horners. And uh, we did dutifully did a full CT angiogram, which was negative, And that's because the problem was actually preganglionic. Postganglionic disease. Um, from the superior cervical ganglion, they ascend. Uh, via the carotid plexus, these are the third order neurons into the skull base and basically more or less follow the course of the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. And these are going to be vascular lesions, especially dissection of the carotid, which we associate with things like, um, you can have atheromatous dissections, arteriopathies like uh, fibromuscular dysplasia, and some masses like glomus tumors uh, in the neighborhood. Here's a patient with uh, FMD with a typical appearance of these beating, webbing, tortuous, multiple irregularities. Uh, these patients are prone to, dis to a dissection. A dissection from any number of varieties. It can be, it can be traumatic, it can lead to, to an arteriopathy. And on imaging, uh, when we see a non-inclusive dissection, you'll see these irregular, long segmental areas of, of significant narrowing. And as, I, as we showed before, uh, some of your uh, thrombosensitive sequences can actually show you the subintimal hematoma that is the marker of a dissection. And then finally, um, vascular masses like this is a, a glomus uh, vagali. Generally, these are benign tumors, so they don't cause as much uh, uh, carotid plexus uh, uh, disease, but in large lesions, you can sometimes get uh, uh, postganglionic corners from these lesions. Okay, so that is everything. I do have just a quick summary slide here. And uh, to start that, i show you a picture of what, what life used to be like. This is many years ago. And this is a picture I'm going to show my grandchildren when I say, before climate change, we used to have snow up in the Wasatch Mountains. I don't know. Keep fingers crossed. Maybe it'll look like this in a few months, right? Hopefully before the mountains close. Yes. All right, so we talked about visual and ocular motor dysfunction. We talked about a whole variety of intrinsic and extrinsic lesions, <coughs> vascular, neoplastic, inflammatory. 
isolated multiple neuropathies, and we talked a little bit about <coughs> autonomic pathways. And we've tracked everything from the orbit, the skull base cisterns, all the way back to the brain. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Now, um, we're out of time, but I did bring the, a quiz if, we, if, we, if we're still doing that. Yeah, of course. Uh, let's do it. Yeah. Can we do it now? Uh, at the beginning of your talk, you used the pronoun we, by which you mean the University of Utah, not neuroradiology, right? Well, the, um, my identity is kind of both those things, but now it's also uh, the VA. Which, which we... Uh, and the reason I bring it up is because, you know, most of our residents, when they leave here, will not be practicing here, and they'll, they may be practicing in a place where they don't even have a neuroradiologist. So you maybe give some pointers for, like, the sorts of things you can do if you're working with a general radiologist. So I, I think that, um, yeah, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with a non-specialist radiologist, they're, they're probably going to need direction. Most of the time, uh, if, the, if the, the disease process is pretty well targeted and the location of the abnormality is suspect from a clinical examination, they can find it. Um, these, uh, these anatomic and sort of um, regional findings that, that are, are typical that, that we've seen here, uh, most radiologists have been exposed to them, and they'll know where these things are, and, and it was, with a little bit of prompting, they can find it. It's kind of like, like the case I had with, with Kathleen just last week, where even as, a, as an expert, we sort of walked past the important finding because we weren't thinking about it uh, in, in, in a very directed way. But as soon as we got the good history that said, we have this condition, and this is the one thing I'm worried about. Radiologists we get into the weeds pretty easily because we have to look at so many things. When we get a brain scan, and oftentimes the history, we're accustomed to having a, a medical record systems that don't feed us a very good history. So we kind of have to look at everything, and there are lots of incidental things that sometimes get our attention. So we're a little, we have a little bit of the shiny key phenomenon that when something looks meaningful, but we don't have a driver to either take us to or away from that, sometimes we can we, we can talk about everything and not talk about the one thing. So when the history is good and very specific, and if you say, I have an abducens palsy and that's the thing I care about, then all of a sudden the arachnoid cyst in the temporal lobe doesn't mean anything and the degenerative disease um, in the cervical spine doesn't mean anything. On the other hand, if, if there, there's a very specific uh, symptom uh, of, of a cranial neuropathy that is in the setting of maybe a known cancer, uh, and, and, and you think, well, this looks like it's somebody that's got multiple neuropathies, then maybe we can open up our field of view a little bit and look at, at, at more things. So I think that um, if it seems like you've got a real problem that you think, that you, it just smells wrong to you, and, and there's, there's something that, that you'd like to get another look at, don't be afraid uh, to ask them, say, to, and getting a hold of a radiologist, I don't know if, if getting a hold of a radiologist is, is as hard as for us to get a hold of you, <laughs> but um, if you, I think if you know where they live and, and have their phone numbers and at least can call them and say, um, this is what, again, this is what we did with, with this patient last week, is call them up and say, I'm really worried about this one symptom. Could you look again and see if there's anything there? So I think targeting, um, targeting specific clinical questions is, is the best way to get for, for us to not miss something.